So again, hello everyone, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you. We are very happy that you have joined us for this very interesting discussion. Uh, this uh, webinar is brought to you by the Stockholm Hub on Environment, Climate, and Security. In this uh, organization, we are four uh, different Stockholm-based institute, CV, Stockholm International Water Institute, Stockholm Environmental Institute, uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, and also Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. And we work together on different topics related to uh, climate, environment, and security issues. And one of these topics is work on information manipulation, information influencing campaigns. And that's why we bring we are bringing to you this discussion on disinformation in the context of water cooperation, climate, and environment. And uh, I would like to start by saying we really were discussing why is this topic important, how is real, how this really connects, and we see that we have a lot of research, as you may be familiar, on different issues related to climate change. We understand how how it happens, why it happens, but uh, we struggle with the communication to the general public to really help them understand this evidence-based research, and this creates a lot of space for different information manipulation and influencing campaigns. One of them is misinformation, when information, uh, right information is shared in a different context. But we also have examples of disinformation, when fluid content is produced to manipulate uh, public opinion on this topic. And I think many of you have been familiar with this. We had the same cases in the case of uh, different vaccination, COVID-19 pandemics. We have a lot of disinformation and information manipulation when it comes to different elections, uh, results of different public voting. But here we would really like to zoom in how it influences different water and climate processes on the ground. So we will take you in presentations from our speakers to different specific contexts. And uh, how we see it, we see that uh, this issue is very serious. And we know that there is also climate action against disinformation. It's a group that works in the context of COP and that published many reports and that's really organizing efforts how we can really bring attention to this very serious issue that we do see as a security threat because it affects public opinion. It affects the ability of our leaders to implement commitments from the Paris Agreement, from Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we think that this is very important. We hope that we will have a more discussion at the end. But I think now, uh, without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor to our keynote speaker, who is Michael Zinkanel. And Michael is the director of Austrian Institute on European and Security Policy. And he will be able to help us understand a little bit more the linkages between the different sectors and climate sectors in the context of disinformation and beyond. So Michael, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martina. Thank you to the Stockholm International Water Institute and the Stockholm Hub on Environment, Climate and Security for inviting me to this keynote speech to this session today and for organizing this very timely and very relevant discussion and session. Thank you for introducing me, Martina. As mentioned, I'm the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. I'm joining you from Vienna, where at the moment we do have actually uh, a lot of snow, uh, which also uh, is one of the issues that we are currently facing with, because in the context of denying climate change, we have seen uh, quite some comments from the broader audience here in Austria as well, that due to the fact that there is snow now in Vienna, um, climate change uh, is not having a severe effect, but this is just as a small side note. Um, I would like to start by setting the scene for this discussion today by giving you a broad overview of the issues of disinformation. And I'd like to start with a very prominent phrase or quote, which is uh, probably known to all of you, which is knowledge is power. And I think this quote is still applicable today, although it has been framed in the 15th, 16th century. And it's extremely relevant to enhance this knowledge, this understanding in the context of climate change and mitigation of climate change, but also in the context of analyzing and tackling unconventional security threats such as disinformation. And against this background, let me start with trying to clarify and trying to give you a definition of disinformation, because so far there is no universal definition, universally acknowledged definition 
of that phenomena of dis disinformation. However, I'd like to choose the most comprehensive, the most all encompassing characterization of disinformation, which has been developed by the European Union, which is that disinformation is characterized as the intentional creation and dissemination of very ver verifiably false or misleading content, either for economic gain or for intentionally deceiving the public. And through this definition, we can say that disinformation causes confusion, causes distrust within a society. It leads to distorting public opinion and perception. It aims to amplify social tension and division and undermines trust of the public, of the general public in institutions or and governments. And therefore, disinformation can be categorized as a harmful motive as a harmful intention as one of the central aspects of disinformation in addition to the disguised appearance of disinformation. So the motive and the appearance, the disguised appearance are two central parameters here. In opposition to satire or to parody, to news or ads labeled as partisan, but also in opposition to errors in reporting, which of course can happen, disinformation is created with the clear intention to cause public harm. So there is a clear distinction between uh, accidentally spreading false information or satire and systematic disinformation. Um, and this is of course undermining the sovereign power of the state or the governments to execute those powers due to the fact that decision-making is hampered and public opinion is being distorted. And we see these systematic disinformation campaigns by state or non-state actors, so-called aggressors and their proxies um, that are creating and disseminate, disseminating uh, disinformation in particular online. The most recent scope, however, has presented a new opportunity to further analyze and understand that phenomena. And we need to widen that scope a little bit because that original definition is still applicable today. However, in order to better adapt to new behaviors in applying uh, disinformation campaigns, in order to apply a new whole of society approach, we need to widen this perspective. And therefore also the European Union has now referred to a new concept, which is called foreign information manipulation and interference, FIMI which is described as mostly non-illegal behavior that is threatening uh, negative impacts of values, political procedures, political processes. And it is central that such activity is manipulative and is also intentional and is spread and created in a coordinated manner. Um, to give you just a couple of insights into the tactics of FEMI, of that foreign information manipulation and also disinformation tactics, the operational goals, I'd like to describe a 5D model that is also applicable here in the context of climate change disinformation, which is dismiss allegations and degrade sources, distort the narrative and twist the framing, distract to shift away attention and shift blame to an other alternative narrative, dismay to threaten the immediate opponents of your information and divide to generate more conflict and broaden division within communities. And I think this is quite a nice definition and nice parameter uh, because it can be applied not only to Europe and European member states, but it's applicable to any case, to any society, to any state, uh, where we're dealing with disinformation. When we're talking now about disinformation in the context of climate change, um, I think that we can say that hostile actors have identified this sphere of information manipulation as yet another successful means to weaken trust. We have seen different other examples during the COVID-19 pandemic, during disinformation campaigns that are that have been spread during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the first early ages. And there are two important lessons to be learned here. First, that during that COVID-19 disinformation campaigns, we have seen that 
scientific facts related to the pandemic are uncomfortable. They are difficult to comprehend, which is why there is a general tendency to avoid evidence-based information. It was easier for the audience and more comfortable to believe in simple solutions presented by this information, which is also the case for climate change denialism. Second, disinformation thrives in times of crises and in times of trauma. Um, in these times, this information does not only capitalize on these crises, it weaponizes them. And climate change presents yet another multi-dimensional crisis with regards to resources, health, society, economy, politics. The entire complexity is vast and is very global and regional at the same time. And therefore it represents a high level of uncertainty and high level of new various vulnerabilities which in combination with the tendency to avoid difficult facts gives us an extremely fertile ground for new disinformation to grow. On social media, we have observed that there has been a very sharp increase in the amount and also in the intensity of climate change denialism with climate change disinformation exponentially growing within the last 12 to 24 months. The phenomena is especially further charged by the number of bots, by the number of automatic programs that perform automated tasks faster and in greater volume. And it's also identified, intensified by this information being spread by so-called verified accounts. Um, and especially this is the case since Twitter now X has changed their policies. Um, and at the same time, we're also seeing that there are negative impacts on climate change disinformation, that these negative impacts remain strong, especially and even after exposing and correcting the false information. Last year, climate change disinformation peaked during the COP27 event, exactly a year ago. The number of tweets have skyrocketed during that time, however, have been produced only by a very small number of accounts. And while this daunting development calls for more urgent action to tackle climate change disinformation, there's hardly any mention in that current COP uh, in, in the United Arab Emirates on the issue of climate change and disinformation. Uh, the COP28 UA has produced six different declarations on various numbers of climate related challenges from global climate finance to climate and health and funding to climate relief and peace. However, none of these declarations mentions this information or the impact of manipulation of information in the context of climate. So there is also quite a gap and still uh, some call for urgent action. And I know that the authors of the policy brief Battle for Water truth and climate and environment will go deeper in presenting also their research and their findings. But let me just finish with two, three recommendations from my own very general ones. On a state level, there must be more international cooperation, more knowledge sharing, more best practice sharing on how to tackle climate change disinformation. On a society level, there must be more tolerance to break out of, own, of their own filter bubbles to create more understanding and awareness amongst each other, amongst different groups of society. On a personal level, we need to be more vigilant. There needs to be more critical thinking and more rational reflection in how we consume and produce our own information. And if we go back to the quote at the beginning that knowledge is power, we have to also acknowledge that depriving people from acquiring knowledge is control. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for uh, setting the scene for our discussions and for sharing with us these uh, important thoughts. We will bring you back towards the end of our panel. But now I would like to introduce our panel of experts. And before I start, I actually have to make also important correction. This event is also co-sponsored by UNESCO. And one of our panelists is uh, Dr. Banu Neutane, who is an advisor for ICT and sciences and open access to science, scientific research at UNESCO. So Banu will be one of the panelists who will be sharing his insights. Uh, for UNESCO, open science is very important. There was even a resolution encouraging open science. So we will hear more about that. Our other panelist is Dr. Karina 
Shiroki. Karina is a Associated Professor of International Relations at Stockholm University. And Karina will be uh, giving us, sharing with us her reflections also on a very particular context of uh, disinformation in the context of the Russian aggression in Ukraine. <clears throat> and our last panelist is Jakob Baraza. <clears throat> Jakob is a, a water and climate governance expert, currently works at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, but previously studied at the IHE Delft Institute for Water Education, where he conducted research on disinformation in the context of water cooperation, especially in Eastern Nile. So this is our panel, and uh, please feel free to also send questions through our Q&A button. But uh, I would like to now start with the first question. It will be one question to all panelists. And uh, if you can please share with us your reflections on who are the main actors using this information and what groups are targeted and what is the effect and danger. And you can introduce it in the context of a particular study or a little bit more in a general context. But I think we will start with Karina. So Karina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martina. Thank you for passing the word to me and welcome everybody to our webinar. As related to the actors that are most frequently and systematically sharing this information um, in the context of Russian aggression in Ukraine, it is Russian state media, Russian media as such, and the so-called anonymous Telegram channels. Uh, Telegram is a social media, one can say designed in Russia by, by a, a Russian developer, and it is broadly used in Ukraine uh, and beyond. And a lot of this information is shared on that particular channel um, where it is an option not to identify yourself. Uh, so it is, in a sense, uh, quite similar to rumors, which spread quite, quite broadly in the context of war. And here I can relate to the opening remarks uh, by Mikhail, who said that uh, in a situation of uncertainty and a situation of instability or crisis, uh, when people seek information and a lot is developing very fast, um, people seek information from various channels, sometimes reacting emotionally and not checking the sources that they're using to obtain the information. And that's where, uh, unfortunately, anonymous telegram channels are often used and people, people become victims of disinformation through them. Thank you, Karina. And now we will turn to Banu. Banu, how would you uh, describe the actors who are uh, behind this from your perspective? And a little bit, if you can share with us a little bit more about your work. Thank you so much, uh, Martina. Well, the first thing you know, that I will do is, and I will essentially try to describe you know, one of the things you know, which is woven in the title of this uh, webinar, that is the truth. Um, Perhaps the, the first, you know, is essentially to understand, you know, disinformation, which Michael has very rightly described as a willful, you know, say, a twisting of uh, fact and information uh, before it reaches the ultimate, you know, consumer of that resources. I mean, you know, this, uh, this information. Uh, the truth is normally, you know, woven in a principle of factual correctness and uh, should be consistent with the reality. And of course, you know, the other thing is, you know, this would also carry objective evidence uh, throughout the vast discourse of, uh, of, of conversation. The sense of truth is, therefore, is a complicated landscape uh, that, is, that is essentially, you know, woven in the uh, tapestry of knowledge and, con and, and, and uh, coincides with variable, you know, evidence. Uh, not least, uh, it exerts, you know, consensus, you know, uh, strengths uh, the, the concept of truth by highlighting the value of collective, say, intelligence. And, it, and that's the reason why, you know, we bring in, you know, peer review and other type, you know, dimension in the whole process. The problem what happens is, you know, during uh, the, um, the conflict, all of these things, you know, that I just, you know, mentioned about truth, you know, essentially vanishes. And in fact, you're left with uh, a void where disinformation essentially becomes um, um, and takes a form of a weapon uh, that can be somehow you know, utilized an opposing party to generate you know, false narratives to manipulate you know, public opinion or you know, international opinion in this. Uh, 
But uh, you said, you know, where the disinformation is targeted to, of course, you know, the, this can be targeted to state actors. Uh, the governments are often, you know, involved in spreading uh, disinformation um, in, 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 in several, you know, folds. The other is also, you know, non-state actors, you know, you actually, you know, see NGOs, INGO and other, you know, like uh, the organizers and involved in the whole process. The final is, you know, and I think this is, this is the canon right now, you know, that many governments, you know, utilizes. It's uh, the, uh, the social media manipulators. And in fact, you know, when they come in, uh, because the the rate to which you know they spread uh, within the tapestry of society is much faster than other you know say organized uh, say um, uh, information channel, but still you know we basically have to look at uh, the biggest source of dis disinformation still remains the media organizations because they are the one you know who are in fact you know like. Uh, um, triggering disinformation in all possible uh, sense. And one of the things, you know, that is very much you know, attached to this is no media or new channel that is opaque for possible, you know, manipulation. They can always be manipulated um, either by process, uh, I mean, you know, pressure, you know, political pressure, because you have seen that, you know, in several countries, you know, which are even, you know, characterized and the, uh, like vanguard of, uh, of practicing democratization in, in, in societies, that that country's media also has been very easily, you know, like come uh, succumb to political pressure. The other thing, you know, that has happened is also, you know, financial pressure is there. You basically provide, you know, resources and you ask a medium uh, to somehow, uh, a, a broadcast, uh, a false narrative, you know, that will reach to its eventual, uh, say, consumer. So I would say that, you know, there is state actors, non-state actors, and social media manipulator, but still, you know, the mainstream medias are still, uh, they are the one, you know, who are spreading um, um, disinformation to uh, uh, the tapestry of the society. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Banu. And I think this is a great segue to our third speaker, uh, Jacob Barraza, who, will t uh, who would like to tell us a little bit more on the actress. And Jacob, you're looking on a very particular case, Eastern Nile. So can you please tell us more? Who is the one who is spreading this information and what can we learn from that case about the danger? Uh, thank you very much, Martina. First of all, I'd like to appreciate the fact that uh, when it comes to disinformation and more so with regards to social media, because my study was looking at uh, the use of social media, and uh, especially Twitter, now the current X, is that we have a number of actors. To begin with, we have uh, the media, uh, personalities or uh, journalists, and this can be done through uh, their practice in terms of trying to engage different actors and trying to bring them together so as to foster uh, cooperation. But again, one thing is that with the powers that social media has given to the general public, it again also brings about another actor. Uh, one, uh, the public is being targeted as a beneficiary in terms of uh, those who are who would want to convince them to take sides. But also, it also gives uh, the public the power to directly engage with the uh, high-level government officials to engage with uh, with journalists and also to engage with diplomats. Uh, the fact that we have uh, social media platforms accessible, easily accessible through uh, internet and availability of phones that one can easily access, that makes them quite a powerful uh, voice in terms of being a target and in terms of also being a, a serious actor in uh, when it comes to public uh, diplomacy. Uh, one thing that I realized from my study is that when you look at uh, the messages, the hashtags and uh, the images that are used, uh, it's such that uh, the language used will tell you what kind of public or what kind of actor is being targeted. Like for instance, if you want to target more foreign uh, publics, then uh, the use of English is used because that way then you can uh, easily target and engage online actors that are from uh, other countries that mainly speak English. And if it's mo mostly internal, then you'll realize that people will go back to their own uh, native language like Arabic or Amharic. 
And so that means that uh, there, there, there is that space that has been opened up beyond the secret diplomacy that has been uh, quite uh, common in the past to more of, uh, I will call it new, new diplomacy, which again brought in uh, the wider range of uh, actors that are uh, being engaged in terms of disinformation and misinformation. Thanks. Thank you, Jakob. And uh, you are bringing a very important context, how these processes affect uh, negotiation on shared water resources. We've seen examples of this from the Euphrates and Tigris negotiations, from the Eastern Nile negotiations, also from the negotiations around the Jordan River. So this is something that's really preventing some of the actors to uh, reach a uh, uh, compromise with, uh, with their counterparts. So we would look into that later. And now I would like to be go back to Karina and ask you if you could please uh, tell us a little bit something more specific on your case that you were looking into. You were looking into the case of Ukraine. If you can share, please share with us some examples of this information used in this context. Thank you, Martina. Indeed, in the case study that I have conducted, I looked into the case of Nikolai, a southern city um, in Ukraine. So on April 12, 2022, due to a Russian attack on, on the dnipro Mikolaev water pipeline, um, the water pipeline has been damaged. And as a result, a city of nearly half a million inhabitants was left without any drinking water. So obviously it has created an issue, a huge issue. Um, the water supply was partially re-established by bringing water to each of the districts in the city of Mykolaiv with particular distribution points and a schedule for distribution of water. Um, in this context, obviously there was shortage of drinking water and in the pipes there was only non-potable water that was not allowed to, to be used for cooking or drinking. So in this context, um, a huge wave of systematic and regular disinformation uh, pieces was occurring and it was disseminated uh, again by various social media channels. Uh, different disinformation pieces were generated on those channels, but also by Russian state media actively. And there were three main narratives that had perhaps different objectives. So the first narrative was that the drinking water uh, in the city of Mykolaiv is missing as such, and there won't be any restorations uh, of drinking water supply. Um, the narratives trust that the city and the entire region uh, is left. Um, so basically the authorities have left the region. There is nobody to, to conduct renovations or uh, conduct the necessary work to restore the water supply. Um, the second narrative was that the water that is being disseminated and distributed uh, to the inhabitants of, of the city of Mykolaiv is contaminated by various diseases, including cholera, and that people shouldn't come and pick up the water. Um, and the third last um, narrative that was uh, resurfacing every now and then was that the water that is being distributed uh, by the local authorities and volunteers, that the water will not be available or won't be provided for children, elderly, and people with disabilities. So this case exemplifies how and which groups are targeted and for which purposes. So first of all, it is pretty obvious that these narratives have been used to, uh, to um, undermine the trust to local authorities, uh, regional, but also city authorities. It was aimed to destroy some, or in some sort, um, harm societal cohesion, introduce uh, some sort of uh, societal clashes, um, but also to, uh, to develop distrust to international and national humanitarian organizations and volunteers who were trying to assist in the situation. Um, there was a study conducted by an organization called CIVIC uh, who conducted um, surveys among inhabitants of uh, different cities, including Nikolaev. Um, and the, the, the results of their studies actually shows that 
um, this information regarding water uh, is indeed targeting quite substantially trust to local authorities, but also this, this information creates a lot of psychological stress for the people, which at the end might make them be less willing to use humanitarian assistance, which is life-saving. And in this way, this information may not only um, damage uh, the psychological stability of, of people, but also make them um, arrive to undesirable conclusions, to make them make a decision, if you like, to flee, for example, when it is not being uh, and when it's not being necessary, and in this sense, by forcing people to make these decisions, this information can undermine not only their health by depriving them of water, but also to endanger their lives uh, by forcing them to flee in a situation of an ongoing war. Thank you, Karina, very much for sharing a very specific examples. I think it will help our guests to uh, to understand the, how some of these processes work. And I now would like to turn to ya Jacob. Jacob, you were looking on the uh, impact of uh, disinformation campaigns on the uh, negotiation process in um, Eastern Nile. So if you can please tell us a little bit more about this case and what strategies were used there. Uh, first of all, uh, the, 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 the whole negotiation process starts around 2011 when there is an, an announcement that uh, Ethiopia is uh, planning to build a dam. And my study looks at uh, the time between 2000 or, or rather 1990, okay, uh, between uh, 2000 and uh, 2022 and remember this is a time when uh, when uh, there are quite a lot of events that are taking place covid 19 has just hit and so there is a lot that is being done online uh one of the key things that came out in terms of disinformation and misinformation is that uh, the kind of images that are being used uh the kind of uh, texts that are being used and the kind of hashtags that are being used is such a way to convince or to shape a certain narrative that will either promote support for the guard or promote uh, support against the guard. Uh, I take a look at, uh, for instance, uh, hashtag it's our dam. Hashtag it's our dam was strategically used to garner support from both other basin countries like Kenya, uh, Sudan, uh, Ethiopia and Egypt with the argument that with the construction of the dam, uh, downstream countries such as uh, Sudan will benefit from uh, having water throughout the year. Uh, but again, when you listen through it, it also calls for them to contribute or even questions of what is the contribution of Egypt in terms of uh, ensuring that there will be sustained flow downstream. Uh, there is also the argument again, again with regards to hashtag our dam uh, to Kenya, which is like, you are also going to benefit from electricity. But most importantly is how the guard is genderized and hashtag our dam together with hashtag it's her dam is used together with uh, images of women in smoky kitchens or carrying heavy loads of uh, firewood to show that this is a dam that is going to mainly uh, benefit women. And for those actors that are interested in benefiting women and looking at uh, the rights and how women can access energy, then this is a narrative that would, uh, would support uh, the guard. But again, you realize that the reason why the guard is being constructed mainly is for energy and more so as a way of uh, generating revenue uh, for industrial development. So the question of how directly women are going to, to benefit from this, again, is a question to be discussed further. Uh, the other thing is around uh, building nationalism for the guard. And that one is also popularized online using hashtags such as uh, hashtag our guard, our dam, uh, hands off Ethiopia with the argument that, uh, remember, uh, the guard is being constructed on our land. Uh, the river is, has a source in our land, and also the monies that are being used to construct the guard belongs to Ethiopians. So 
Uh, for those of us who are not interested in seeing the development of Ethiopians, kindly keep off. And this is a narrative that is built both by um, uh, Ethiopians abroad, uh, Ethiopians uh, in Ethiopia, and those that are supporting the guard. And it's used to justify the argument that, okay, the other countries who might raise concerns in terms of how uh, the developments are being done, how decisions around operation and maintenance are being done, or sustainability of the river, uh, it's argued that, okay, for you, you don't have interest and kindly keep away from uh, the discussions on the guard. Uh, so you can see from this engagement and the fact that with social media, it targets many uh, millions of uh, people, uh, then it creates a certain narrative targeting a certain specific group of It seems we are having, please continue, yeah. finish your thought. We are having some technical issue, but if you would like to finish your thought. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, is that uh, these strategic narratives are used to build or garner support for the guard. And on the other side, when you go to Facebook, we also had other groups that were specific to the different countries and supporting their other agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. And now we will go to Banu. And Banu, could you please tell us a little bit more about what kind of work UNESCO does on disinformation and on exposing this uh, global problem? If you can help us to better understand our participants, how an organization like UNESCO works with these issues. And uh, while Banu is talking, uh, the other panelists, if you can please look at the two questions that we have in Q&A. We will turn to them right after Banu speaks. And uh, to the other people who are listening to us, please, if you have more questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A section. But Banu, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Martina. One of the things, you know, that I was, I was really, you know, fascinated by something that Karina and Jacob uh, actually explain in their narrative. And what UNESCO essentially does is, you know, it actually tries to see that uh, um, whether or not, you know, disinformation uh, should be the uh, realm of, uh, of the, the communication uh, that happens in, in the world right now, or there should be something, you know, that is much more, you know, say, um, vetted and trusted, you know, uh, communication that happens. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you are aware of, you know, something that we organized uh, and both the speakers have already said that, you know, internet uh, is uh, the key, uh, say, platform, you know, through which uh, uh, disinformation spreads. So one of the things, you know, that UNESCO primarily does is, you know, we're trying to somehow, you know, or like come up with uh, some kind of, you know, globally agreed agenda on uh, internet for trust. So we're trying to see that, you know, if there will be a guideline that countries can essentially follow, to obtain the uh, the social media platform or you know the um, the internet in, in their country primarily to uh, to uh, make sure that disinformation doesn't fly you know we are for uh, uh, um, access to information but we are not in for access to misinformation or disinformation this is where you know I think you know so putting some kind of you know like uh, a stronghold in the mechanism that transfer, you know, some of these disinformation or misinformation needs to be uh, be somehow planted. So, Internet for Trust, you know, which is uh, which was organized, you know, sometimes uh, in in February this year, uh, and that that information is still available there. And some of you uh, who are who think, you know, how Internet uh, needs to be. Uh, somehow entertained uh, for uh, as as an information you know channel or vehicle to uh, to, to to the world, um, they can still you know provide uh, their comments. So this is this is still you know they. So internet internet of trust is you know, one of the things you know that we are doing. But the other thing you know that we are also doing you know we essentially want uh, to uh, um, to to instill uh, the the characteristics of you know freedom of you know information and universal access to information. So this is also another thing you know, that we're doing uh, where we think that you know, uh, sometimes you know, disinformation happens if the information doesn't reach to its intended you know, beneficiaries. So we are in fact saying that, you know, okay, there should be a right to information. We actually you know, um, 
are are uh, are uh, monitoring uh, the, uh, the 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 sustainable development goal, you know, sixteen point two, you know, which primarily talks about you know access to information. So we are monitoring you know that particular you know say. Uh, uh, say point in uh, sustainable development, but it's more than that. You know, we're trying to see that uh, we have seen that disinformation is being used as a weapon uh, that can somehow uh, be be uh, be utilized in its uh, on uh, the opposing you know, parties and and generating you know, false narrative. And you know? so this is something you know, that we are doing. The other thing you know that we are also doing is that those uh, journalists you know, who are uh, spreading you know say good masses to each other we there is a program you know that actually uh, protects the rights of uh, a journalist to spread the right information to to the world so there is also uh, freedom of expression and and journalism is one of the uh, the the access of the program you know that uh, that unesco does and what it does is it not only uh, like uh, uh, develops uh, uh, the uh, that the framework you know that guarantees a, a journalist or a media person to convey and receive you know information without any threat because you know most of the things you know that we're doing right now is uh, during conflict you know there is some kind of you know say say um, um, a stronghold imposed by the governments you know who who are you know trying to instill you know a different kind of you know parameters you know what kind of information can be shared or received you know by um, uh, by by the journalist or by the medium. So this is something you know that we're doing. We're trying to you know instill that. The other thing you know uh, that we are also doing is uh, on media and information literacy because a lot of uh, consumer they do not know you know what kind of information and they should accept and you know trust and what kind of information they should somehow you know deny or refute. So this is there is also a major program you know that we do. Uh, that is uh, that is primarily on media information literacy. One of the, uh, the the third thing you know that we are primarily doing is to instill that you know okay what are the technological innovations that are available there? Can we somehow you know, bring that uh, to fore so that whatever information goes through a social media site or you know through these electronic medium can that be somehow you know like check or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 tools will be available for the consumer so that you know they can in fact there is a review and see that whether something you know that is given to them is is correct or not so we are in fact you know, working on this you know three pillar one that in way ensuring that journalists will provide you know like uh, the the information that comes in without any threat or 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 any like um, um any any inhibition the other thing you know that we are also doing is uh, to see that um, there is uh, the, the in citizens as well as you know like those people you know who share the information are properly trained and educated and finally you know what we are doing is that we're bringing in uh, the, the 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 available technological tool uh, and then you know try to see that uh, if some of these uh, things uh, that uh, spreads in electronic medium can somehow be uh, put through uh, some uh, a fact check checking, you know, say mechanism so that the information that goes to its ultimate, you know, consumer goes without any kind of, you know, say misinformed, you know, entity or element in it. So these are the kind of three things, you know, that we are doing at from from the UNESCO side. Thank you very much, Banu. I think you actually partly also answered the first question that we have from Junior Mike Vejuli. I'm very sorry if I mispronounce your name, but now uh, I would also like to hear from Karina uh, your thoughts on the first questions. How do we detect and counter the spread of false or misleading information about water and climate issues on social media platforms? And if you can please try to be concise, I will also bring our two other panelists uh, uh, into to, to reflect on these questions. So Karina, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Martina, and thank you, uh, Mike, for your questions. Um, detecting this information um, and, and finding remedies for that, uh, this is a multifaceted issue. Uh, I think that here we must uh, distinguish between various actors and their motivations to generate and disseminate this information. Uh, to my opinion, the most dangerous this information is one, it is coordinated, systemic, lasts in time, and is state-sponsored. 
And we've been witnesses of Russian systemic disinformation on various issues, including climate, water, conflict, uh, you name it, uh, since uh, many years uh, ago. Uh, Russia has been systematically disinforming the global public about various issues and its channels still exist, right? So Russia Today or shortly RT, how they're called now, and Sputnik. Uh, um, existing or they do exist and function in many countries especially in the global south they are quite effective in targeting various populations disseminating uh, various disinformation and narratives um, and here i think that the response should be uh, systemic um, training uh, and literacy um, work is of course very important to to be able to uh, make people more uh, resilient to disinformation. But when the main actor is a state actor, and it's not to say that Russia is the only um, the only actor that disseminates systematically, there are other countries that engage into that, including Iran, for instance. Um, so it has to be systematically addressed. Um, something that I just want to add to what Mikhail said in the beginning, uh, Mikhail mentioned that knowledge is power. And here I would like to add that critical thinking is a life-saving skill. And of course, literacy has to be increased in terms of information checking. Uh, and if to uh, go back to the case that I studied, uh, Mikolaev case in Ukraine, we can see how uh, local authorities adopted uh, robust and effective communication technologies um, and approach to that uh, and how they're using social media, even those platforms where this information regularly disseminates, they in a way started their own channels and they try to battle the disinformation narratives through verified uh, channels, uh, providing information, um, not hiding their faces, naming their names. Um, and by that, they're using the same platform in order to, in a way, not necessarily have a dialogue with the actors engaged in disinformation, but rather to counteract and battle them on their own battlefield. Thank you very much, Karina, for giving us very specific examples. And now, Jacob, uh, based on the work you've done on Eastern Nile, how would you say that? How can we detect and counter the spread of false and misleading information? I think over and above what has already been mentioned, there is a need to, to, to engage uh, researchers. Because one of the things that I realize is that even while looking at some of the negotiations, uh, and the information that was being shared is that the, the best way that uh, the, the misinformation, disinformation was count countered was through findings by researchers. Uh, the only challenge that we have with uh, that is that, again, uh, research and the manner in which it's, it's disseminated is not easily accessible. So over and above looking at how researchers can be engaged to, to, to combat disinformation, there needs to be a, a, an, an intended move to make sure that the research and the findings is disseminated in such a way that it can be easily accessible or disseminated via social media. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And I would also like to bring back Michael, who gave our keynote speech. If he, you can reflect, Michael, your thoughts on this first question brought here to to by by our participant, Mike. Absolutely, I'd love to. Thank you very much for the great question, and actually also for the amazing answers that we have already received from the various speakers on exactly that question: how to detect and counter the spread of false or misleading information, especially about water and climate issues on social media platforms. And I think a lot of great examples have really been brought to the table. First of all, I think there has to be more awareness that this is indeed a security threat and a threat to societies, governments, uh, different people in different society groups, economic uh, threat as well. So I think to understand the severity of the issue is probably the first way of, of solving it as well of then putting more efforts from a multi-stakeholder perspective on detecting and on countering uh, such misleading uh, information on social media platforms. And I'd like to also refer uh, to the third question that you have asked here, if there should be more partnerships and collaborations with social media platforms 
Um, absolutely. I think also that the European Union has already made quite significant steps to engage more with social media platforms to raise also the level of accountability that these platforms have. They're in my eyes, part of the problem as well, because they provide indeed the platform where such disinformation is uh, able to be disseminated and where it's able to be shared with the general public. Um, but we also have to include the economic incentive of companies, of lobbyists that are also uh, facilitating and, and actually uh, buying advertisement for social media platforms to spread such information. Um, so therefore, I would suggest as a general remark here that a multi-stakeholder approach is needed that includes the platforms, the economic actors and entities behind running these platforms from an economic incentive perspective. Of course, the governments who have to engage with platforms and the private sector more actively and the general public slash academia science to also raise from a social perspective, from a bottom up perspective, the issue and bring it more to the attention to the other stakeholders. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, now I will, uh, would like to turn to my colleague, Kelty Gold Goldie Reiter, who works at CV, uh, also with these issues. And I would like to, Katie, ask you if you can reflect on this from the youth perspective, what can youth do about these issues? And uh, tell us a little bit how we see youth at uh, CV. And then after that, I will go to Banu, because Banu, I think the third question is really directed to you because you'd work with these issues very much. So, but first, Katie, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Martina. Uh, so I'm the Youth Empowerment Champion uh, for our Water Cooperation Diplomacy Team at Siwi. <clears throat> so I work uh, to support youth inclusion in our activities. <clears throat> Sorry. So often we see youth uh, from the UN perspective, which ranges from an age of about 15 to 25. But at Siwi, we take a little bit of a broader approach uh, and we have a definition of youth that is inclusive of 35 and under. And very often we use the terminology young professional instead because sometimes uh, people can be quite young and working in this space, but they don't really want to identify that way. They want to be seen more as professionals in their field. So we try to uh, phrase it or frame it a little bit like that and be a bit more inclusive. Um, and uh, acknowledging of the wide range of expertise that can range up until 35, that is youth. Um, I think a lot of the things that have been said today about media literacy and science literacy are things that youth and young professionals are calling for themselves. They see this as something that really needs to be done. My addition to what has been said would be that uh, it shouldn't be done without them. Uh, youth and young professionals are very active on uh, the different digital platforms. Um, they and we, <laughs> I, have grown up with it and we're used to engaging this way, but they also acknowledge that there's a lot of misinformation that gets spread uh, through there. And so when we develop uh, capacity building, it should be really a two-way street uh, with youth uh, developing for them, seeing the best way to target it and approach those kinds of uh, campaigns uh, for media literacy and science literacy uh, done with them. Um, so a two-way street of exchange, I would say. Thank you very much, Katie. And I think now we will turn to Banu to, to uh, say a little bit more concluding words on the partnerships and collaboration with social media platforms, but also other stakeholders like us, the scientists, different institutions. How can we work all together more effectively to tackle this problem? Oh, well, thank you so much, you know, Martina. And uh, the uh, I, I basically uh, say kudos to the person who actually posted this third question, because that is the... Uh, uh, the heart of the problem that uh, I think entire our society deals with right now, frankly put. Uh, see, partnership with social media platform is extremely difficult because uh, they are uh, based somewhere else, but they operate you know globally. So unless you know you have got some kind of you know federated mechanism that exists, or you know if you can. Uh, uh, establish or, or a partner uh, in in developing uh, how they design their algorithms. That will definitely you know make a headway because you may have you know heard or you know watched this video in social media that you know whenever you are watching in you know, a TikTok video in China, you basically receive you know something else 
than how you, um, uh, you, you watch in a TikTok video in other countries around the world. Because in China, you know, they, most of the videos that circulates are, are for you know, scientific triumph or you know, youth doing fantastic job and so forth. When you're uh, watching the same video or try to get into TikTok uh, in other countries around the world, uh, what you receive when you open the TikTok uh, the, the platform, you receive you know, something else. So I think you know, there should be something or a way to somehow you know, manipulate or design algorithm that is uh, socially fit and socially you know, um, uh, useful. That's one of the things. But one of the things you know, that is extremely important is you know, how you get you know, uh, a government and institution involved in this. When we talk about in you know, a social media uh, platform, that actually gets uh, related to you through a telecommunication operator or an internet operator. So how would you go to them and make them uh, somehow realize that whatever the content using their backbone is being spread in the uh, society is wrong. So this should also come on, uh, come on uh, board. Uh, one of the most uh, important thing is, uh, again, you know, I bring back the issue of media and information literacy to public because public engagement is the key. Uh, perhaps uh, I think uh, uh, there will come a time that uh, the school, uh, as soon as you know, students you know get into the middle school, instead of in the, uh, other than you know uh, teaching them about uh, say sex education and all kind of things, and you know, perhaps you know social media ethics and the values will also be instilled in students. And I think the time has already come, uh, or perhaps you know we are already late to do it. Uh, so that, you know, as soon as, you know, students get into middle school, they understand the context of, you know, using social media responsibly, because uh, it's not only during, uh, say, uh, the, 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 uh, the events uh, that is uh, uh, related to the conflict, but other times also social media is utilized, you know, differently. And the youth engagement to the overall, you know, say, uh, uh, disinformation is extremely important. And what Katie said is, you know, super, you know, useful to the overall, you know, thing that how can the youth not only become, you know, responsible and useful, say, uh, uh, internet user, but at the same time also become uh, uh, become engaged in somehow dissipating in some of these in disinformation that that uh, that uh, is carried by this thing. And finally, you know, there are several uh, fact checking initiatives, you know, that have come up. And uh, these are all, you know, AI algorithm based, you know, fact checking. Um, all you have to do is, you know, uh, if uh, uh, Facebook or Google or, or uh, Instagram or others, you know, will start, you know, providing a little tab that, you know, okay, check for the fact or something like that, that will in fact you know, bring the entire, you know, say, uh, social media differently because what we will have to do is, you know, we'll have to somehow, you know, uh, like bring in this, you know, flag, fact checking, you know, initiative as an implicit, you know, say element of, you know, social media platform. And of course, you know, this is something, you know, that uh, the Internet for Trust uh, that UNESCO organized that has, you know, built some of these things. But to what extent, you know, this will be adapted by the countries? I think, you know, this is this is in the hands of the countries. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Banu. And now we are nearing the end. I would just like to ask uh, all of our panelists to think in maybe one sentence, what is it that we need to focus on to bring this uh, issue forward to some more successful resolution? So Karina, I will start with you. I will put you on the spot. So with one sentence, what would you think that, you know, what should be our next steps as working with this issue? Uh, I can only repeat, uh... The, the arguments that were provided earlier, it is that it is important to recognize, realize, and talk through the nexus between security, water, and climate so that it becomes widely accepted uh, before we can arrive to any policymaking strategies. Uh, and, and here, first, we need to seek consensus on recognition of the issue. Thank you very much. And Jacob, what are your thoughts on this? What are our, What should our next steps be? I think uh, from my end, uh, social media is here with us. Uh, it's here to stay. And uh, in the words of Banu, uh, we need to look at it from how are we going to, to enshrine integrity in uh, the manner in which we are using it so that mm -hmm. as we move forward, we can curb 
uh, misinformation and all the security mm. risks that are uh, aligned to it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And now, Katie, what are your thoughts? What should be our next steps? I think the spread of disinformation, misinformation is uh, unavoidable and controllable, but we just have to have better ways of uh, responding to it and countering it uh, when we interact with it. And an inclusion of youth in this is fundamental to making this uh, an effective response. Very good. And Michael, what what would you be your recommendations for our next steps? Yeah, I would like to agree also with Jacob that social media is here to stay. We certainly have to live with that fact. However, there is also artificial intelligence and new technological means that are already here and will be increasingly uh, relevant in our private, social and also our professional lives in the future. So we should also think ahead one or two steps how these new technologies, especially with regards to artificial intelligence, can also charge, supercharge and influence the spread of disinformation, especially also vis-a-vis uh, climate change and against the background that we are here also at the cop 28 also the uh, urgent call for the leaders of uh, the cop that are here uh, that are that are uh, participating to include that issue this information with regards to climate change more into uh, the talks the discussions that are being held at the cop thank you and banu very very brief concluding uh, thoughts what should be our next steps the next step, uh, just to one that, you know, we should have a middle school curriculum established on a, a responsible social media uses. And I think and I'm looking at Katie, you know, perhaps, you know, she will, in fact, you know, take the first step toward mm -hmm. instilling that. The second thing, you know, what we have to do is, and this is something you know, that we have been discussing, you know, even before the start of this, uh, this webinar, we have to somehow, you know, break, uh, 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 breach the divide between scientists and journalists. We are talking uh, the same thing and uh, systematically, you know, trying to, uh, to address disinformation, but scientists are talking with scientists and journalists are talking with journal uh, journalists. Perhaps, you know, there should be a way to somehow, you know, cross over. And uh, again, you know, uh, uh, what I will do is I'll invite you know, everyone to be part of this, uh, this World Press Freedom Day next year, where we will primarily be talking about environment and uh, information. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Banu. I can only say that CV is very committed to work with these issues. Uh, if you are at COP, please do reach out to our colleagues from the Water Pavilion. You can also reach out to us by email. We would love to hear more thoughts from you. And uh, please uh, stay with us for our next events. And thank you for your attention. So bye-bye. Bye-bye.